I'd like to transition us to the panel discussion. Um, I, there are a few topics that I'd love to dig in with our speakers today. Um, so yes, I, have, I think we have everyone here. Please don't forget to unmute if you're about to speak. Um, and the first question I have is actually for Sung, um, who is a solution architect at um, DBT Labs. And Sung, I'm really curious kind of about your reflections on implementing and helping com your, your clients and customers implement DBT at scale. Because I'm sure you've probably seen things go really well and things go not well. And yeah. um, you know, maybe reflecting on some of the topics we raised today and, and your experience, what are the things that um, you've learned that you wish everyone kind of knew or some of the major mistakes that you think companies can avoid when um, e either starting to implement DBT at large scale from the get-go or scaling DBT really fast? Yeah, great question. Um, I've seen dozens and dozens of things. Um, quick anecdotes, I've seen people just copy and paste stored procedures into DBT models and kind of hope and pray and wipe their hands. I've seen people run single jobs, one model at a time, and then chain those jobs together uh, just because the paradigm was just so so net new to them. But those are extreme stories that hopefully none of the people here have ever encountered or will ever be tempted by. But I think the biggest thing is, I think Jason, you did a really great job illustrating this, e even just like the, the through line and tone of your conversation where, and I think this is just true of software where um, tech is not our salvation, people are. And, you know, what I heard in, in terms of why DBT made you folks successful isn't necessarily because DBT in and of itself has this like magical power for people to do things. It's because your team had strong opinions and backed up those opinions with evidence that, hey, let's do it this way at this context in our season of maturity. And you stuck by that, right? Versus I see a lot of times people, they start off and they think like one week of charisma of just like, hey, let's just do it things this way. But then they capitulate when people start complaining at them and they just loosen their standards so much where it just becomes another spaghetti mess by a different flavor, right? And so I think uh, I think it's tempted to go like, ooh, like let's go into this niche feature and that'll be the silver bullet to solve people's problems. No, it's people solve other people's problems. That's what it is at its core. Now, in terms of enabling that, I've seen... I've seen the meta play out this way. You know, I think it's tempting, um, especially when you start off, even if whether you're a small or big organization, just go, hey, let's go all, let's go straight to multi-project. Let's have a finance DBT project, supply chain, et cetera. Hey, let's go straight into let's let's create the, the most custom bespoke GitHub actions or GitLab pipelines to do all these like very nuanced things. But sometimes you're so tempted by that, you're successful at the wrong thing, right? Where it's like, I built all these beautiful models, but if no one is using it. And they're just like, mm, nice Tableau or whatever BI dashboard sung, export to CSV, copy and paste it in Excel, move on with my life. Did you really win? And I hope all of us kind of, you know, think, no, that's not winning. And so just saying, you know, in a tactical perspective, hey, just start out with a monorepo, keep things very simple. Sometimes you really can get away with, hey, I only have like maybe 100, you know, DBT models. I have some simple star schema data model with, hey, here are all my transactions to think calculate things like revenue by month. Here are some other dimensions like customers and addresses and you know, you know, click stream sessions, all that fun stuff, and just move on with my life. My DBT job is DBT build, and that's it. Because it only takes what maybe like 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the size of your data. And people can get away with that for a couple of months. And that's a great thing. I think what what really matters is less about, hey, look how cool my code is, and like, oh whoa. Jose from accounting is actually using my gosh darn work and is bragging about the data that's powering it. They are not, you know, the metrics isn't like, hey, like, let's just look at uptime for data pipelines. It's, hey, like, how many times is Jose complaining to me? Is that number going down into the right? Hey, how many times is Jose or someone else from another team bragging about our work and saying, hey, like, supply chain, we've heard great things from the finance team. Let's go about it from there. And so it's really about securing those early wins and building champions you know, across business units so that they celebrate the data team versus just like, oh, like I just play hot potato with them through Jira tickets and that's my only you know, rapport with them. And so that's that's what I've kind of kind of seen you know, in terms of avoiding common pitfalls is start simple and then you can you know, tackle complexity one module at a time versus trying to big bang and go niche all the way up front. So yeah, that's my answer to that. 
Wow. Um, I think you've, you've distilled some really great wisdom here, Sun. Um, and the, the people first approach, not the tech first approach, I think res resonates really strongly with everyone. And also, um, I think we've kind of seen it through, the, through a few talks today because um, I think all the solutions that, you know, the successful solutions that, um, you know, Felix and Yorit and, uh, and Jason and, and Alex and Emily talked about, they were all targeted at actually how to make people more successful, how to make it easier to do the right thing. And I think that's a very, very powerful mental model versus how to like optimize for scale from the perspective of just making things run, you know, faster, which I don't think anyone actually talked as much today, which I found, I found really interesting. I think all the problems we try to solve uh, indeed were the people problems. Um, so, with regards to scaling GBT, I think that what's interesting is that many teams um, who are here today and definitely um, a few of our speakers have scaled GBT either from you know a team of two to over 35 people or zero to 200. I'm wondering how you think about what is the total addressable market for GBT in your organization? Do you think that you've reached everyone who you want to be able to contribute or... Um, there is bigger potential. And what do you think stands between your current, let's say, penetration of analytics engineering in the organization and the full potential that you'd like to get to? Um, I guess curious to hear thoughts from um, um, Emily, Felix, Yoret, Jason, Alex, all of you. All of you implementing DBT for your teams, basically. Sure, I can jump in and go first there. I think one thing that I personally find really exciting about DBT as a framework for scale is I think SQL is generally like kind of the um, kind of most approachable for like the kind of like lingua franca throughout like the data science community or like the data community at large. You know, I mean, I think some pockets may use more SQL in Python or SQL in R or just SQL in Tableau or something like that. But um, I, I know I was really inspired by kind of like Alex's talk, especially I think of um, kind of hearing about how to get DBT to not just be a tool for analytics engineers, but really taking full advantage of SQL being that lingua franca to, you know, be kind of like pulling the best of the best of what's data science building. What are data analysts building for the like seven teams doing similar types of funnel analysis, putting those in packages and pulling them kind of like further upstream and more centralized. Um, so I think in my mind, it's almost like getting away from thinking about analytics engineering as a role and more thinking about it as a tool or a mentality that all data practitioners in your org adapt. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, yeah, Jason, go ahead. Yep. Um, so in terms of the total market in, internally with Virgin, um, I in my head, I would like everyone who touches data to be using the tool um, or the new tools. Um, but in terms of bottlenecks, there's probably two layers to that. Um, so there's the technical. Um, as I said at the very beginning, we're doing migration from on-premise servers into the cloud. So that naturally has to take, you know, time across the company for all the other teams elsewhere. Um, and then also it goes back to the people problem of we need to, you know, change the mindset of these teams because they've worked certain ways for so long. Um, and then we need to change that um, and show them the new way and the, you know, the sunny uplands of the future and the modern tech. And, you know, we have to sh share the benefits of what we've done with them to convince them. Um, but once that, you know, once we do that, we tend to find that people come on board quite quickly, which is good. Um, and then from there, you know, we just keep expanding. So there's there's still some growth in what we do yet, if if not 10x growth eventually, which is quite crazy to think about considering the size already. Do you remember correctly that your next milestone is 200 to 1,000? 
Yeah, that's the aim. Um, that should hopefully not cause too many issues. <laughs> um, it, it's an interesting, yeah, scaling problem because I think we go, we you kind of go through stages of you know small startup mentality of zero to ten, for example, and then you hit the hundred, and then you hit slightly different issues and problems, and then one I, I tend to find now we're kind of plateaued in you know in the problems we we kind of have the solutions baked in and so we don't see we can 200 300 400 potentially might not be an issue um it's yeah it'd be interesting to see when we hit the thousand or so what challenges that's going to bring so but that's yeah the long-term goal <laughs> if not more that's awesome even 300 people is like 10 data folds um awesome um Felix, you're uh, curious about how you're thinking about M and, and your bottlenecks. Yeah, for, for us, um, it became quite, oh, sorry. Um, for us it became quite natural that also, for example, our engineering department uh, began to use DBT and they also like it to, to integrate it in their processes. Um, so for example, they you know they take some data sets, uh, they build it, they figure out what they want, they build it in DBT and include it in their like normal uh, workflows, for example, to AWS Lambda function, et cetera. And uh, that worked pretty well. However, I think um, you need a really good onboarding. So they consider it as part of their option space and not stick to their old patterns and make the entry barrier quite low. Um, and also, you also need a close collab between the data and engineering team that you avoid double work and also try to them uh, making like use of the canonical source that are already there and not build their kind of shadow pipelines and uh, uh, completely in a different direction. So I think a good good onboarding low barrier and a close collab with the other DBT contributors is a good way uh, to go. Awesome. Yeah. Um, maybe regarding addressable market, um, like from the customer, like our customers, our internal customers, are, are basically people that, that need insights to make decisions. Um, and there are, are still a lot, you still need some kind of pipeline of people and many different roles to deliver those insights. And um, like in my opinion, like getting the insight that some business person needs should be as easy as like Googling for like restaurant ratings and finding something. So I'm kind of curious how this whole, um, like language model thing maybe might pay off uh, enabling people to interact with data with natural language. Um, so basically DBT already like lowered the entry barrier, like making um, basically data more accessible. But I think ultimately like the, the ultimate user that does, doesn't speak as uh, SQL in the end um, and, or often doesn't. And it's even too hard to like work with BI tools because all, also BI tools need some kind of learning curve. But we all can speak and ask questions. Um, and that's something that I'm super curious of, with, like DBT and um, documentation and uh, especially like defining metrics and dimensions in, in documentation, if they might boost and make data more accessible through lang natural language. Yeah, that's a great yeah, point. Yeah, really great point. Um, I was just going to add, yeah, I think... Um, one of the bigger issues that we found is um, like knowing SQL is not the same as knowing how to model your data. And so I think one of the challenges that we've run into is um, people know SQL, especially engineering, know SQL really well, um, but doesn't always think of things in terms of data modeling and like how to build out a data warehouse um, as opposed to like a transactional database or even just like querying the raw data. Like they're more than happy to query raw data generally. Um, but building out the models has been probably the biggest challenge in um, training people. Um, so that's been really interesting. And we're still working through um, how to how to train people. And um, Emily, your point really resonated with um, analytics engineering being a mindset instead of a role. And we go back and forth on that all the time because teaching the mindset is really hard. So it's like, should we just hire the role or should we try to teach everyone this mindset? Um, and that's sort of where where we're at right now. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Alex. Um, something I'm, I'm also curious about is 
um, as DBT becomes and analytical data pipelines become more and more, hopefully, source of truth for the business, and that data gets used in a variety of applications, not just maybe ad hoc reporting, but you know, business intelligence, machine learning, uh, but also probably putting that data in front of your users or um, board members or you know, even public for public companies or you know, regulators. How um, does that affect the needs for data to be accurate and within the, I would say like the compliance efforts. So uh, there's one thing when you're serving data pipeline to a data scientist who does something like it does a deep dive and then goes in and presents the, you know, the data in front of, um, let's say even the executives, right. But another thing is when this data actually gets in the hands of um, either your customers or regulators or, you know, general public. So, um, are you at a point where you are thinking about compliance when you scale um, DBT and pipelines? And I'm also curious, Sung's um, opinion on that, because I'm sure that you come across different different um, types of customers that are probably, some of them are being highly, highly regulated. You don't have to type. You can you can talk. Um, I, I can go first. Um, so I kind of have like two stories here. Uh, one, I won't name the company, but they are a healthcare startup that uses DBT to ensure that prices are compliant. You know, for certain claims, for example, and like reimbursements. And there was just like this really cool anecdote that someone shared with me. I was like, wow, like we made sure we weren't overcharging this person by thousands of dollars because of a check we had in DBT. And we were able to resolve that pretty quickly. Um, and I noticed as DBT has matured and people are like settled with the mindset that it isn't just being used for historical analysis like revenue by month, it's becoming more embedded and sitting in between that land of like historical analysis slash like part operations. I've even had you know a, a prospect I was talking with that they use just simple stack, Snowflake, embedded Tableau, and DBT. Um, and they sell that as a SKU within their online product. And they just serve that up. And you would think like, really? That's enough? And for them, that's enough. They're making money. And it just blows my mind that you don't have to go all the way to this extreme of like intense, like have to start learning React and do all the software engineering thing to actually use data to like sell a compliant product. Um, but I think even I'm thinking even back to 2014 version of Sung, where I was using something called audit command language. So think proprietary version of SQL for accountants, and it's as awful as it sounds. And the reason why we had to do that is because it was approved by you know the SEC, you know, for Sarbrian's Oxy compliance. Because what it does is they were really good about logs, where it's like, hey, you did this join. Here are the records dropped as a result of that join. And here's maybe a preview of those records. So it's like, hey, did you drop, you know, certain cash inflows, right? So think signals for, hey, what did you like um, make sure debits equal credits, even simple things like that so that there's like balanced books, right? And so I've even seen from a regulatory perspective, people needing to use something like a DBT with logs to show to like a government board of like, hey, like here's our logic. Here's how the sausage is made. We're not trying to hide anything from you. So there's that. Wow, special DSL for accountants. That sounds scary. Yeah. And I think in my mind, something else that I'd add on is not just like the quality of the data, but I think when you think about kind of like doing things in a very rigorous, like well-governed way, the very formulaic way that DBT forces you to kind of like create artifacts is also kind of like the proof is not just in the logs and in the putting of like your actual data, but the fact that, you know, like if you're using kind of like a Git based deployment and CICD, the fact that you can always like have your entire DBT project version controlled. So if then if you are like, you know, you can answer like exactly how calculations were done at any point in time using DBT um, kind of tools like snapshots. You can also kind of like rewind your data set to any given point in time, actually see what some of those values are. Um, 
in my mind, it's not just kind of like, the truth is not just in the pudding of like getting your results right in the moment, but being able to like go back later and add through those questions in retrospect of what was done and when and how and why, I think can be like also like super powerful and add a lot of confidence. Yeah, I think the auditability of anything in the world of data pipelines is probably going to be one of the key things or, or challenges for, for scaling, right? Because the more people contributing, the more complexity and the more business builds the kind of mission critical use cases, the more you kind of have to understand how the code base evolves, the data evolves, and how the code and data are kind of interacting with each other. Any other compliant um, thoughts? Yeah, I think it was already oh, mentioned, but we basically also um, leverage snapshots whenever something is uh, going into use cases that are reported externally, be it for like accounting and tax, like uh, legal related things or um, in, in investor and stakeholders. And in those cases, you usually use snapshots to being able to like go back in time and see how certain data points ended up in, in the report that we sent out at some point. And yeah, pretty basic, but um, like really important tool for us. That makes a lot of sense. Um, awesome. Um, we are coming up at our time. So I want to say huge thank you to everyone uh, who came today to attend the meetup. Um, huge thank you to all the speakers who prepared lightning talks today. I think I personally learned a lot and really amazed by just the thoughtfulness of um, everyone in, ter in terms of developing tools and processes for scaling um, data and people. Um, thanks, Sung, for stopping by and, and sharing your perspective from seeing a lot of success and horror stories as well. Uh, and also big thanks to Sarah, uh, my colleague from Datafold who helped put this event together. Wouldn't happen without you, Sarah. So thank you so much. Um, before we part, a um, couple of things in terms of um, events and follow-ups. So this was recorded. So we'll share the recording with everyone um, who've attended and also who've missed uh, but registered. Um, next data quality meetup will be focused on the topic of data migrations. So if you are in the midst of migrating from something really scary and slow to something really awesome, um, that probably will be helpful to you. Um, that's just a topic that's been coming up a lot in uh, in the data community recently. And uh, there's a lot to uncover there. Migrations are scary, uh, go over budget, budget, and sometimes not even complete at all. Um, and that's probably going to be um, sometime in the summer. So stay tuned for the announcements. And in two weeks, we will also be running a virtual hands-on lab about using um, DBT with DataDiff. It's an open source tool that we developed here at Datafold that helps analytics engineers build faster by being fully aware of the impact of their changes. So if some of the topics around auditability and how does the data evolve with the code and um, compliance are relevant, please stop by. Um, the idea of the virtual hands-on lab is that we will walk around through how to set up um, open source data diff with your DPT project with three easy steps. And hopefully you'll walk away um, with some superpowers for your analytics engineering workflow. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, happy scaling. Hope that next time we, we see you all, you'll be all running in the hundreds and thousands of, of DPT users in your organizations all compliant and high quality. So thanks again. Have a good rest of your day and uh, we'll be in touch.
Appreciate you all. Bye. Peace.